Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome our guest speaker today, Dr. Uh, Thomas Giordano from the Department of Pathology at the University of Michigan. Go blue, I guess. Uh, Dr. Giordano is a Henry Clay Bryant Professor of Pathology, and um, and he's also um, director of the um, Tissue Molecular Pathology Research Research at the Comprehensive Cancer Center, and he's also director of the Division of Molecular Genomic Pathology. Uh, he started his uh, career in, uh, he's originally from New Jersey and did an MD, PhD uh, at the Robert uh, Wood Johnson Medical School in New Jersey, and then he went on to do the residency in anatomic pathology at the NCI, and then followed this with the fellowship uh, uh, in oncologic pathology at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And uh, since then, since 1994, he's been at the University of Michigan. <laughs> so, and today he's going to talk to us about evolving insights into thyroid cancer from genetics and genomics. Welcome. Thank you, Paul. So I really hope this is uh, not, a, not a letdown after that visit from the dean. Um, I'll, try, I'll try to catch up on those minutes. A uh, little disclosure here, um, just reading some slides. We're not going to talk about that. So it's really been an amazing decade. If you, uh, I spent eight years involved with the TCJ. We've learned so much about mining all this genomic data for many types of cancer, uh, including thyroid cancer. So um, that's what I'm going to focus on today, but it, it's really been, it's remarkable how much we've learned. So this is the, the uh, data that m my talk is based on. It's really a, a, a wealth of data, starting with individual studies on RAS and red fusions and, and BRAF. The TCGA wrapped up on thyroid cancer in 2014. We've had studies of uh, radiation-induced uh, cases from Chernobyl. There was a pan-cancer atlas that put all the data from the TCGA together. The MSK, Sloan Kettering's impact assay, have looked at poorly differentiated and anaplastic carcinoma. And now there's so much data out there just from routine genomic testing that you can now aggregate <clears throat> all this published data. And it helps if you have someone, you know, at, at these companies. But uh, there's one study at the University of Colorado that assembled genomic profiles on about almost 800 uh, thyroid cancers just from routine clinical care. So it's a massive amount of data. This is a big topic. So I, I tried to extract what I view as 18 essential insights that we can learn from all this data. So uh, I think this is the vision from 2008 in which that we would continue to use established determinants like histology and immunostochemistry and staging, but by adding all these other genomic and molecular features, we would arrive at a better place. And I think if you look at what's happening in thyroid cyt cytopathology uh, with all the molecular testing, it's, it's largely true that we have arrived at a better place. So now you can have a molecular test and have pretty high confidence that your nodule's not cancer based on its gene expression profile or its genetic profile and, and not have surgery. So this, this was envisioned in 2008 and I think we've realized this. There's still things to do. So just a little background uh, for those who don't uh, think about thyroid cancers every day. Uh, here's the histologic spectrum. Papillary carcinoma is about 85% of all. And the TCGA, because of this number, forced us to just do papillary carcinoma. We actually argued to let us do herthal cell, anaplastic, poorly differentiated, medullary, follicular, um, but they're rare. And the TCGA came back and said, one, if you dilute that across, you dilute your power of 500 tumors across all these tumor types, you'll dilute your power, and you won't really have much confidence. And they were right. They also said it's our money and we're going to, we, we dictate <laughs> what, what we're going to do. So they forced us to do probably the, the, the cleanest, genetically cleanest tumor. But in fact, it really did, as you'll see, it really formed the foundation for all the subsequent studies of these rarer types. If you look at papillary, uh, the classical type uh, is predominant. There's also various follicular variants, whether they're infiltrative or encapsulated. A few years ago, we carved up uh, the encapsulated non-invasive and made a new category uh, called NIFP. Um, this was after TCGA. And then the tall cell variant, uh, which has uh, BRAF mutations and a little more aggressive. And then lots of microcarcinomas, which are too small to really study well at the TCGA level. So they're sort of left out of that project. 
And this is just a very simple model for everyone to keep in mind when we talk about the underlying genetics. We have a MAP kinase dominated pathway along papillary carcinoma. Uh, sometimes they evolve into poorly differentiated or even anaplastic carcinoma with increasing output of the MAP kinase pathway dominated by BRAF V600E mutations. And then there's a follicular pathway that has more <laughs> RAS and P10 and PIK3CA mutations. Um, but they can all merge up and you can have both pathways leading into more aggressive forms of thyroid cancer. Very simple model. And then the other thing is, as we're going from uh, your left to right, we have loss of follicular cell differentiation, which is actually the scaffold for the classification. So that's a key point. So there's three main types of papillary carcinoma. There's the classical type that makes little finger-like papillae, the follicular variant, which doesn't have papillae, but has uh, recapitulating the normal follicular structure, and then this tall cell. There are other variants. I'll talk about the other variants at the end, but this is mi mostly what you see, and there's a really strong genotype-phenotype correlation. So when I see this through the microscope, or when we see this, we can think about BRAF V600E and RET fusions. The follicular variant is dominated by RAS mutations, and the tall cell is almost always a BRAF V600E driven cancer. And this was known even before the TCGA got started. So the TCGA, I think everyone's familiar now, it's to, was a big study to deploy large-scale genome sequencing across the common cancer types. Uh, and then the whole goal was to write up one paper that sort of announced the data to the field. This is the pipeline that they built, frozen samples, pathology checks, sequencing, copy number, uh, epigenetics, central storage, genome data analysis centers, uh, with the ultimate goal of writing, again, a single paper. This was not a quick process because they had to uh, find the tumors, collect all the data, generate the data, and then write the paper. And I was responsible for writing this paper, and I can say it did take me a whole year to put that whole paper together. So it was, it was fun, though. So on to the essential, 18 essentials with a few sub-insights. So I'm going to start with the pan cancer atlas because I think uh, there's some nice snippets in there for, for thyroid. 11,000 tumors, 33 cancer types, all published last year in cell. So this was uh, one of the papers focused on ploidy. So each paper in here had a, had a particular molecular theme. This is Matthew Meyerson's work, who's at, at Harvard. And they took uh, about over 10,000 tumors, and they looked carefully at aneuploidy. And in the process of, that, process of doing that, they developed an aneuploidy score, which is a measure of just the degree of aneuploidy. And you can see they ranked the tumors by few uh, little aneuploidy to lots of aneuploidy. And you can see thyca is the symbol for thyroid cancer in the TCJ. Papillary thyroid cancer has the most stable genome of all the cancers that they looked at. All right? So it sort of starts to explain its very indolent course and why 95% of patients with papillary carcinoma live, you know, 20 years or so. Very indolent disease. Similarly, they uh, looked at mutational burden. So if you rank all these tumors by the degree of just mutational density across the genome, thyroid cancer is down here along with AML, a very low mutational burden. So again, this, together with the lack of aneuploidy and a low mutational burden, suggests that this uh, is the reason why these are such indolent tumors. However, as a pathologist, I spent a lot of time looking at individual cases and you can see also, if you look at the, at the data, there's a handful of tumors that have higher mutational densities. And if you pull out their pathologies, you can see they, they are more aggressive histologically. And formally, if you look at the tall cell variant, which we know is a little more aggressive form, they have a slightly higher mutational burden. So even in, in, in well-differentiated papillary carcinoma, you can start to sniff out that mutational density and burden uh, plays a role in the pathology. Uh, just a reminder uh, about this pathway these pa that I mentioned before, but the TCGA study really drove this point home, that this, these pathways were so dominant in this disease. So we have RET fusions, uh, RAS mutations, and BRAF mutations, just driving home the point. We really didn't find a lot of other mutations in papillary carcinoma, which I'll show. So I'm going to show a lot of these figures, these complex representations of genomic data. Um, I've seen this figure a million times by now, so if I 
say something that's incomplete or confusing, just stop me because I, I assume a lot. So this is 500 tumors. Uh, each tumor is a, a vertical line. Right here is the single nucleotide variant data. And you can see the genes that we found. There's BRAF. So we have 59.7% that have some sort of BRAF alteration. Here are the RAS genes and EIF1AX, which was a novel finding for this paper. And notice they're mutually exclusive. So that's one of the messages of the TCJ is that there's no point of having more than one of these single nucle nucleotide variants. They're, they're sort of doing the same thing. It gets even better, though, because here are the gene fusions. And so when the single nucleotide variants stop, the gene fusions start and are present in about 13% of cases, and they're mutually exclusive with each other. So the single nucleotide variants and the fusions are all mutually exclusive with each other. And then you can see when those end, there's an enrichment of copy number changes, big copy number changes, arm-level chromosomal changes. And so the hypothesis from this is that these are, are essentially biologic, biologically equivalent. You can have a, a single nucleotide variant, a fusion, or some large chromosomal ch arm change that can be a driver of papillary thyroid cancer. And when we were all done, there was a small number of tumors, the black box down here, that we called the dark matter of the, of the genome, right, where you couldn't find, find a mutation. So my co-chair in this was Gaddy Getz, who trained in physics. We always like to talk about dark matter. Um, so this, this is a nice figure that summarizes what we learned from the TCJ. We basically could find three molecular biological groups. The BRAF-driven group that are dominated by classical and tall cell, so we recapitulated those results. But now we know that, that the signaling from this is so strong, it leads to high levels of ERK transcriptional program and loss of thyroid differentiation. So there's an inverse relationship between signaling with high output of the MAP kinase pathway and loss of differentiation. On the far end is the RAS driven, and they have just the opposite. They have weak uh, ERK output and MAP kinase output, but are retain a lot of follicular cell differentiation. And the fusions, the RTK fusions, are classical type. These are follicular, classical type, are sort of in the middle there. So we can define three biological groups, and this has importance for when you treat patients with radioactive iodine, because these are the tumors that are most likely to become radioactive iodine resistant. We spent some time looking at the clonality of these common drivers, and this is a program called Absolute, developed at the Broad, and you could see uh, number one means that the molecular, they can find the mutation in, most of, in all the tumor cells, and the vast majority of the tumors are clonal, and that matches up nicely with what we do in immunohistochemistry. If you stain a papillary carcinoma with a BRAF V600E specific antibody, it'll stain all the cells. And this was important because there was a lot of literature suggesting that the clonality of BRAF was a prognostic marker. And I think those studies just, just uh, failed to compensate for the lack of, for the presence of stromal cells. So, so this was an important statement for us. So this is a sub-aim, 5B, or sub-insight. So I just can't resist showing some data from my lab back in 2005 that really showed a principal component analysis using old-fashioned Affymetrix chips, gene expression profiling, unsupervised, that these tumors fall out by their genotype. So you can see the BRAF with the tall cell, the RAS, follicular variant, and the, the red fusion cases, the classical type. And so what this is basically saying is that there's such a strong correlation between genotype and gene expression, it sort of explains why all the molecular tests on the market, whether they look at gene expression or they look at genotype, they're all looking at the same thing. And that's why they all perform about the same, right? So without mentioning those tests, I think the people that do thyroid cytopathology know what I'm talking about. So this is why it works so well, because of the simplicity of this cancer genome. So uh, another complicated uh, figure this was really quite remarkable. I showed you the mutual exclusivity between BRAF and RAS. So that piqued the interest of several people in the study and said, let's look at that. And so we developed this BRAF-RAS score in which we looked for a gene expression profile that could separate BRAF and RAS, distilled that down into a minus one and plus one, with minus one being more BRAF-like, displayed all the tumors along this BRAF-like, RAS-like spectrum, and then added all the genotyping data. 
and then all the genomic data. And you basically see you have this great separation here, and all the genomic data are, are basically telling us that the biology of these two groups is so different across all the genomic platforms that this really is a very fundamental difference. And it even begs the question of, should these RAS-like tumors even be part of the classification of papilloid carcinoma? So I really like this study because it really got to the, the most fundamental level of pathology, tumor classification, and, and started to suggest maybe we don't have it done the right way, right? Maybe these are more like follicular carcinomas, which are also driven uh, by, by RAS. But what's other interesting here is that, um, well, and we'll come back to this, notice there are some BRAF mutations that are actually counter, counterintuitively RAS-like, and we'll, we'll explain that in a minute. So this, I think, is the most enduring uh, contribution from the TCGA, because now I was just at the thyroid meeting, and people talk about this routinely. The clinicians talk about this. Oh, this mutation, it's, it's BRAF-like, it's RAS-like. So I think this is the, the enduring contribution, again, uh, from the TCGA study. So to follow up on that, BRAF can be activated by various mechanisms with different biologies and properties. So we'll just d drill down on this. There are some BRAF other. This is K601E, which is extremely RAS-like, and these are actually indels, not point mutations, and they're RAS-like. And then there's also BRAF fusions, which are weakly uh, BRAF-like. And notice there's nothing else down here but BRAF V600E. So these are the ones that have the strongest output uh, on this BRAF-like scheme, and those are actually BRAF V600E. So that's really kind of interesting, and it speaks to the fact that BRAF is rather promiscuous, it has lots of fusion partners, and can uh, become an oncogene in, in a variety of mechanistic ways. And so we actually need to be taught precise, and I've, I've broken my own rule here. Uh, Gaddy used to stress this. When we talk about BRAF-like, what we're really saying is BRAF V600E-like, because there are other BRAF mutations that aren't BRAF V600E-like. It's a, it's a minor point, but uh, unfortunately the clinical world just says BRAF-like. So here's a nice example of a tumor with a K601E that's been worked up. Uh, the, the Yuri Nikiforov at Pittsburgh published a bunch of these. And these are these beautiful follicular variant and other follicular carcinomas. They're not the classical type PTC tall cell variant, right? So really strong correlation. We also looked at differentiation, so another complicated panel. We developed the thyroid differentiation score. So we took a bunch of genes that we know are involved in follicular cell uh, metabolism, thyroglobulin, thyroid peroxidase, the symporter, uh, the cytine, uh, imp uh, the importer, um, I'm sorry, and a few other genes. And here's individual genes, but the thyroid differentiation score is an aggregate of 16 genes that are variably expressed. And then we developed this and displayed the tumors by their genotype again. And you can see here's BRAF V600E, and they, as a group, uh, have less expression of these genes than the fusion genes or the RAS-driven or and, and certainly normal thyroid. But there's something, and so this is as expected, but there's something really interesting here. There's a group of tumors that have higher, that have BRAF V600E, but yet are better differentiated. And so that suggests that there's actually a more biological diversity within this BRAF V600 mutated group, which is kind of important because if you're a clinician and you're wondering, should I treat with radioactive iodine, if your tumor's on this end, there's a chance they might, might respond. If they're down here, then they're more likely to be resistant. And so there are people trying to understand this, and this might actually be, I won't go into it today, it might actually be modified by mere expression. So it gets, you know, all, even in a simple cancer like papillary carcinoma, it can get kind of, comp biology gets complicated quickly. But this was a great result because it really drove home the point that this is not a uniform group of tumors. Uh, we know that as pathologists because we, we see this all the time, but from the clinicians, they just do a trial, say, let's do a trial on, on these tumors, but you really have to understand that it's, it's more complex. Okay, so now we're going to, to move more into more aggressive tumors, the poorly differentiated and the anaplastic carcinomas. Uh, and this is a figure from Yuri Nikiforov's one of his chapters. And basically, we know that the number of driver alterations increases as you go through the spectrum. As you, as you become histologically more aggressive, you accumulate more mutations. Kind of commonsensical. 
This is the study from MSK where they used their impact assay, which I think is about 400 genes, to characterize a group of poorly differentiated and anaplastic carcinomas. And uh, it's kind of interesting. So there are BRAF mutations, there are RAS mutations, they're mutually exclusive, and they also match up with this called this poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma differentiation. For those of you who practice thyroid pathology, you know there's the Turin criteria for insular carcinoma, um, uh, the original type of, of poorly differentiated carcinoma that Dr. Rosai was involved in describing and others. Uh, and that's the definition here, uh, the, the green definition, and that's generally a RAS-driven disease. Ronnie Gosain at Memorial has been recognizing that there are other tumors that fit uh, not the exact criteria, but still have increased mitotic activity and necrosis and are sort of higher grade papillary carcinomas. And their definition is here, and those are driven by BRAF. And so the distinction between BRAF V600E like and RAS like holds up, is maintained in poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma. Kind of a key point. So that, that's interesting. Um, you can see there's still some fusions. You start to get TERP promoter mutations, we'll talk more about that, and you start to get a few more uh, P53 mutations, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. The anaplastic, excuse me, um, also have BRAF and RAS, but the signature that they could see, the gene expression signature between the BRAF V600-like and RAS-like was lost in anaplastic. And the thinking is, is that there's just so many mutations there that that signature, that distinction, is being overshadowed by, by, the, um, by the density of mutations. So you cannot really talk about uh, RAS-like and BRAF-like uh, anaplastic carcinomas. So it's preserved and poorly differentiated, but harder to see in anaplastic. And so this uh, reinforces that. This is that insular carcinoma with the Turin criteria, and this is a RAS-like uh, disease. And then here's one that has a few papillae, but you can notice it's more solid here with mitoses, and this would be a poorly differentiated carcinoma by the MSK criteria. And, this, and I think Ronnie's correct that these tumors exist, and they, the point is they do, more, they, do more, uh, they do poorly compared to traditional papillary carcinoma. And these are BRAF-like tumors. So if you... Sorry. Yes. So when you go back to this one, no, no, the following one, the following slide. Yeah, this the one. apology slide, no, the previous one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So are you saying that actually there is any reliable morphology criteria to separate them, um, the total differentiated carcinomas, uh, depending on their uh, molecular signature? I mean, because here the two have different the morphologies are very different. So are these reliable differences? I think they are. That are in, in, so when you have you seen this in multiple tumors? Yes, absolutely. If you go back to um, Ronnie's data here, here that you can see the poorly differentiated car definition, there's a few that break the rule, but in general, the RAS-like and uh, are, have the, the Turin definition and the BRAF have the, so I think it's real. So you can feel pretty confident that when you see this tumor, it either has it's driven by RAS or some other RAS-like mutation, and that these um, are, are, are more likely to be BRAF. So I think, I think it does hold up. And then when you look at uh, these additional mutations summarized here, you can start to see that the increasing mutations in the PI3 kinase path pathway, the SWI sniff, uh, MMR, and methyl, methyl transferases, so, and with, with higher mutation frequencies in anaplastic. So it's really pretty clear as you go from well differentiated to poorly differentiated to undifferentiated, you get increasing mutations, and they do concentrate in some pathways. Uh, P53 is here, I mentioned that. So you go from basically in, in, P, in the TCGA, we found very few, like one or two P53 mutations. In poorly differentiated, they go up to 8%, um, but yet almost 73% in, in anaplastic. So it's a hallmark of, of histologic progression. And we can see that. So here's a case that had mixed morphology, sort of a papillary carcinoma, and then a more uh, 
almost like a comedo breast cancer type morphology with mitoses, and you can see this has accumulated, uh, you know, diffuse staining for P53 consistent with the mutational pattern. So, but yet this is not quite all the way to anaplastic because it still retains some uh, follicular cell differentiation. Uh, TERP promoter mutations, so we have the canonical mutations uh, common in thyroid cancer, very rare in uh, TCJ, only about 8% of cases. And if you look carefully at the, uh, the allele frequency, they're subclonal, but by the time you get to poorly differentiated and anaplastic, the TERP promoter mutations are clonal. And so you have this model, and you can envision a model in which in a papillary carcinoma, you get some cells acquire a TERP promoter mutation, and over time, they enrich as they progress on to more aggressive forms, okay? Um, so it's, a, it's a thought to be a transitional event in tumor microevolution. And if you look at the MSK impact data, they published a study after they had 10,000 patients go through their, their platform, and they looked at TERP promoter mutations across all the different tumor types, and sure enough, thyroid cancer is right up there with almost 60% of cases, and just a small number, but you could say that TERP, terp mutated cases did, um, did, had lower survival. So I think it's, it is turning out to be real. The question is, what should places like, like us, like in Michigan and Minnesota, do about this? Can you identify, can you use this molecular test to identify cases ahead of time uh, that have TERP promoter mutations? And if you did, what would you do differently? So Yuri at Nikiforov at Pittsburgh, who has this, you know, routine genomic screening, they, they're doing that, but I don't think they've answered the second part of that question of what do you do differently when you find this mutation, right? But I think there's potential here. So the collect, I, there's lots of papers. Uh, collectively, though, there's, there's a lot of data to suggest that the third plays a prominent role uh, in tumor genesis and, and particularly progression of thyroid cancer. And there's even, you know, lots of review articles already. So, um, Herthel cell carcinoma, sort of an enigmatic type of tumor. The WHO constantly switches it from, it's a follicular cancer, it's not a follicular cancer, back and forth, back and forth. So there were two studies published uh, recently um, on the genomics of Herthel cell carcinoma, and the theme through both of them was that it was a genomically unstable cancer with widespread chromosomal losses, also mitochondrial DNA alterations, and so here's the one from, uh, this is from Boston, and they show lots of uh, each tumor this way, lots of loss, and then even whole genome doubling. So I happen to also be the co-chair of the adrenal cancer uh, TCGA project. And I, I, the similarities between Herthel cell thyroid cancer and what we found in uh, adrenal cancer are really quite striking. So, and they're, they're sort of like, they look a little similar. Uh, so it's really quite interesting. But this tumor, uh, so here's one study, and this is the one from uh, MSK, and here's their copy number summary where they have uh, different uh, whole number, um, whole, whole genome doubling and other alterations. And so not a lot of recurrent, uh, you know, BRAF, and there's a little bit of RAS, but very different. So the point of these two studies is that Herthel cell carcinoma is genomically distinct and is characterized by an unstable genome, including whole genome doubling. And so they really don't look like other types of thyroid cancer and really don't belong uh, with follicular carcinoma. So here's a nice Herthel cell carcinoma. So I think we now know this is a distinct type of thyroid cancer, not, should not be a subtype. And actually the latest WHO removed it even before these were published. So. Uh, and this is typically what we see, occasional mitoses, and it's beautiful histology. So there's still more, more work to be done. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these genomic studies, uh, like in the adrenal cancer one, don't really point the way to new therapeutics, and I think that's true for the Herthel cell cancer studies. Um, radiation-induced cancers uh, from Chernobyl, and so as you might imagine, radiation in induces double-stranded DNA breaks. These tumors are more prone to get gene fusions including the ones we know, plus some other ones that are more novel, um, but yet they still get an occasional BRAF V600E uh, 
few, uh, single nucleotide variant or a K6R1E uh, compared to sporadic. So they're enriched for um, gene fusions. And there's another big TCGA-like study of even more of these going on. I'm not sure what it's going to show, but more fusions probably. Right. And then metastases, right? So the few patients that do die of, of, of thyroid cancer, usually from distant disease. So the question is, how are they different? They don't get operated on very often. So just to prove to you that the U of M and Ohio State can collaborate, this is a study <laughs> that we did uh, with Matt Ringel uh, at Ohio State in which we pulled out whatever metastases we could have in our pathology archives. And you can see the U of M and, and the other ones that don't say anything are Ohio State cases. And we did find some novel mutations. But you notice this is a very small cohort in comparison, and we need, we need to do a lot more work in this area. But again, it's, it's difficult to do because these patients often do not get um, biopsied. There's even more, and you know, I, I will spare you, but there's some really nice studies out of Korea uh, that look at follicular adenomas and follicular carcinomas, uh, and lots of people all around the world are getting into this genomic characterization of, of thyroid cancer. The nice thing about the TCGA, though, is it's sort of the foundation on which all these studies are compared. So it's a very nice comparative genomic analysis. And then uh, I mentioned the aggregation of clinical data. This is from uh, Brian Haugen's group in Colorado, and they aggregated almost 800 advanced and anaplastic thyroid cancers. And using big data, they were actually able to sniff out several subgroups of anaplastic carcinoma. Uh, which is quite, quite an accomplishment. So now we talk about different types of uh, ATC uh, driven by different groups of oncogenes. So that's a step forward. Whether it's a therapeutic step forward is yet to be determined. But really nice to see that they were able to do this. And I think some of these people were from Foundation Medicine were able to get, oh, Jeff Ross, the VP at, at Foundation. And so I think, uh, my final insight is that these mutational frameworks are fundamentally changing how we think about thyroid cancer, right? So we can think about a low-risk disease with BRAF and RET fusions. Pediatric tumors uh, have less uh, BRAF. Follicular carcinomas driven by RAS and, and PAX-A PPAR gamma fusions, sort of a high-risk differentiated that start to accumulate TERD promoter mutations. Um, and, and, and accumulate other mutations in various pathways, sort of an aggressive PTC, overlapping with poorly differentiated aggressive FTC, herthal cell carcinoma, and then evolving into these types of anaplastic carcinoma. So it's, it really has changed the fundamental uh, foundation um, of how we think about these and now how we actually treat them. So it's been very gratifying to see this change go on um, in, in the clinical meetings. A uh, beautiful summary figure, figure from Jim Fagan. Again, papillary carcinoma dominated by BRAF, RAS, and RET, but then evolving with the accumulation of other mutations, PIK3CA, mTOR, AKT, and the key role of P53 here uh, with its predominance, uh, and sort of many of the same pathways I just talked about. So a nice uh, conceptual thing. If you want even more of this, you can read a review in the AJP that I wrote up. But even it, you know, it's just a year old or a year and a half old and it's almost out of date already. But uh, I go through the various types and talk about all their pathology features and their, their genetic uh, phenotypes. Um, so that's, that's out there. And then my view of, of how these all develop, sort of similar. This was actually before you know, Brian Haggins' paper that suggested that you could divide this up. But this is sort of like a, a BRAF-like and a RAS-like alternating pathways leading to uh, progression. So I think, and then increased mutational burden as you go along this, this pathway. So this is what I wrote up at the time when I published that. What do we still need to do? And it's nice to see that some of them have, have already been, been done. So um, definitely ongoing work. We now uh, can avoid unnecessary surgery for benign nodules, uh, understand the progression from benign tumors to thyroid cancer, and identify those benign tumors that will undergo malignant transformation. That's a key point because we have tumors that have RAS mutations. 
Many of them get taken out, and we diagnose them as adenomas. They're non-invasive. But if you had left them in there, would they eventually evolve uh, and invade and become a cancer? So the thinking now is, if you have a RAS mutation, you should have it out. Not everyone agrees with that. So uh, it's, it's, it's an area of uh, active thought and investigation. What do we do with these RAS mutations? And it's one of the reasons why some of these genetic classifiers don't perform so well. If you have a BRAF mutation, you know that's thyroid cancer it needs to come out. But if you have, I should say, BRAF V600E. If you have RAS, eh, the pathology is a little, uh, so the pr m predictor for malignancy is not as strong. So should malignancy be done on all adenomas? No, I don't think so. Um, you get down in the weeds of the pathology, right? So I have a lot of RAS adenomas because my threshold for calling things the follicular variant is a little higher. Uh, whereas other pathologists call a lot of those cancers, so there's a lot of differences. I, 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 don't, I don't think uh, it adds much at this point to know if you have a completely resected nodule, whether there was a RAS mutation there, it, you're done, right? Um, I think we're making progress on this transition to poorly differentiated anaplastic carcinoma, and there's even another study uh, being run out of Canada. Uh, it's a global study. Uh, Michigan's part of it. We're sending cases and they're doing whole genome sequencing, so there's going to be even more genomic data that comes out on anaplastic carcinoma. This is a big one, response to radioactive iodine, because, you know, anytime you, you know someone's resistant to a therapy, it's best not to give it to them. And so who will benefit? And it's not a trivial thing to do, but I know Jim Fagan at Memorial has a study where they're sequencing patients that have exceptional response to radioactive iodine, uh, and we're trying to find cases to add to that study. Um, and then this, I think, oh, the Herthel cell carcinoma, we now have a better sense of the mutational landscape, uh, and then the j hallmarks of th novel therapeutic approaches, which is difficult, as you all know. So I'd just like to summarize with a few slides to, to drive home some of these points. So when we look at this through the scope, this is a classical PTC. What we can think is BRAF V600E-like. It probably has a BRAF V600E mutation or, or RET or some other fusion. It has intermediate MAP kinase output, and it's intermediate in its thyroid differentiation, and it's sort of an intermediate risk tumor. Tall cell variant is almost certainly uh, BRAF V600E driven, strongly BRAF V600E-like, has strong output, reduced thyroid differentiation, and are thought to be at higher risk for recurrence. Not a tremendously higher risk, but a higher risk. The follicular variant are RAS-like, driven by RAS, and PPAR gamma and other, and other rare fusions, has weep weak MAP kinase output and is the most differentiated tumor and is uh, under the ATA guidelines thought to be a low risk tumor. We have some other variants, the Hobnail variant. These are predominantly BRAF V600E like and driven, uh, driven by, uh, by that and are higher risk. There's this diffuse sclerosing variant which are enriched for fusions, have some BRAF V600E and are sort of a missed risk tumor. And then the rare cribriform morular variant which is FAP-associated, has nuclear beta-catenin on IHC, and it's important for, for us to recognize because that can be the first sign of someone having uh, FAP. So these, these genotype-phenotype correlations are extremely strong in thyroid cancer, and I, you know, I think it makes, I think doing all this genomic work has made me a better surgical pathologist. So I look, sit at the scope, and I say, oh, I can almost see the mutations through the scope. It's kind of fun. <laughs> So, in summary, I think the genomic landscape of follicular cell thyroid neoplasia has been partly elucidated. We still have some work to do. And I do think this is leading to fundamental changes in the, the classification and the diagnosis of thyroid cancer and the treatment of patients. So I'll just close, if I have a minute, um, a little personal story. I grew up in New Jersey, as, as uh, Pablo mentioned. My folks have a house at the beach in a little town, and Hurricane Sandy came in 2000 and 12 and sort of wreaked havoc at the beach. There was a boardwalk here and a boardwalk here and left tons of sand around the house, which we went and dug out. And, um, and the Army Corps of Engineers, oops, the Army Corps of Engineers just finished seven years later rebuilding the beaches, uh, dredging sand off the coast. We'll see if Mother Nature agrees, but the house is sort of back to its old 1940s character and we took the dog this summer, so she loved it. So. A little, it's been an interesting decade because my parents lived there and evacuated right before the storm. And, but we were able to get, my mom still lives there, 
on the second floor and um, get them back to their beloved beach house. It's been a wild year, wild decade. So thank you for your attention. Yeah. I think there's a little time for questions despite the dean coming. Yeah. <laughs> Andy. Tom, I got a question about the queen number four with your biomarkers for the radioactive iodine response. Yeah. I mean, this is something that we sometimes struggle with too right now, honestly, with insurance companies when docs do order testing on our panels for thyroid cancer post resection. So not, not in the, in the, mm -hmm. the pre-diagnostic workup with plant surgery, let's understand patient management, but in the post setting. Right. Yeah, it, I think I alluded to it. I, I, I think it's going to be uh, a little genetic, a little epigenetic. I think there are certain uh, oncogenic mirrors that are enriched. Uh, there was a whole part of the TCJ study that I didn't show on, on oncogenic mirrors like 146B and others that sort of fine tune the, the, uh, the, the yeah. Um, I don't want to speak because it's not published. Jim Fagan at Memorial is doing a study uh, specifically on this where they're looking for those exceptional responders and sequencing them and they're they're seeing different genetic profiles so there may be a genetic component to that but it probably will be a multifactorial eva evaluation that'll come out of that um, there's also drugs that you can get cells to to redifferentiate so memorials run several trials of those where you can get undifferentiated or RER resi resistant tumors back to responding so there's, it's an interesting area to, to work on. Uh, I wish we had a little more of that at Michigan, but I try to collaborate with the guys at Memorial every chance I get. I think this is an interesting talk, also a good talk. I think we have, we have guys too, but we're also a graduate pathologist. So if you think the molecular testing will be a standard, so if you call too much tumor, it's actually not cancer, then you, so, you hold it responsible. When you say aggressive, you mean like uh, calling things follicular variant, that type yeah. of aggressive? Yeah, so that's out there. I, I thought molecular pathology would, would reduce that, but yes. I was part of the NIPP paper, and uh, if you look in, you know, in the supplement there, the, the, the diagnostic variance is quite high still, and we had face-to-face -face meetings where it got a little testy, I should say, where <laughs> You know, some people said, well, let's just call these adenomas. If they never recur and don't come back, why are we calling them anything yes. other than adenomas? And it's interesting, at the WHO meeting, not to drop names, but I was sitting next to Anthony Gill, and he's whispering to me, in Australia, we just call these adenomas. I said, Anthony, you should really speak up. So apparently I've learned that there are regions around the world, like Australia, Northern Europe, that really have not embraced NIFP because they just call them adenomas when they're not invasive. So. Do I use NIFP? I occasionally do, but I try, I try to stomp out thyroid cancer as much as I can by, you know, refusing to diagnose it whenever I can. <laughs> uh, because I do think, I do think the pendulum swung too far. Yes. And like I get a lot of consultations where we were talking about a dinner last night. There's a typical goiter, but in there are a few pockets of cellularity within the hypoplastic nodules. And the mistake is to look at them too carefully, because then you find, oh, there's a groove in there. And then they go, I better send this case for a consultation. And so half the time it's just saying, no, it's a goiter, just let it go, this is fine. And you know, I don't want to be condescending, but just don't get too, but people are afraid of missing these little little things. So I've got a legal case I'm in the middle of right now where, where there was um, you know, a fight over whether the nuclear. So the molecular testing should be, uh, should be. The problem, uh, is they're, they're problem is they're all RAS though, right? right? Yeah. So. Um, RAS is not going to be the molecular savior for that situation. I know, but uh, you have, when you become a panel specialist, you have to hold a certain standard. If your calling right. is to, you know, to, to have two, two, just two, two rules, and then it does not meet the molecular standard, then you're not yeah. an expert. But I, I hate to admit it, but there are cases in the TCJ that I probably would not call cancer. Yeah. Right? Because we actually, we actually, in the course of the study, we had some bandwidth for a whole genome sequencing. So we picked those cases that didn't have an obvious driver mutation. And the four, four pathologists on the TCJ, and out of like 35 cases, we could only agree on benign versus malignant on like less than half of them. Wow. Right? Yes. 
So, but this is that's been, comforting. No, well, <laughs> they're the they're like encapsulated nodules with a few yeah. nuclear grooves, right? Sure. Um, wow. So those are the ones that sort of went off, and those are the ones in that profile that have those copy number changes. They don't have fusions or BRAF or RAS. Um, it, it all depends on your viewpoint. So that that's still a persistent challenge. But I think the comfort is. So when we were discussing the P, the argument was that I came back to some people, I said, listen, if you think that uh, I'm doing harm to patients uh, by calling these adenomas, in our medical legal system, I'd be dragged into court on a regular basis. And it just, you know, it hasn't happened. <coughs> Question. So, uh, similar topic. So there was this famous paper uh, about so-called thyroid cancer epidemic in Korea, where they yes. started surveillance to So how can this uh, technology help us with that? And more specifically, you yeah. mentioned here after 600 years, all this cancer. But we do see uh, yeah, the clear change in the background of Hashimoto's. So I wonder if you have tested yeah. the basis of Hashimoto's, whether you will find low level of here up and are you sure it's all this cancer? I think mean, that's sort of the dogma now. I mean, there's obviously some cases. So we went through this years ago with the rep fusions and Hashimoto's and people finding them. And I think a lot of a lot of that was erroneous, but I'm not aware of the BRAP in, in PTC and what maybe you're sequencing, you know, if you're grinding up sections, you're catching like little microcarcinomas. But the Korea was story was interesting because it was all about screening. They were paying the Korean doctors could make like forty dollars on the side if they did an ultrasound of your thyroid. And so they were finding all these little incidental microcarcinomas and sending people off to surgery. So it was really a, a medical practice driven epidemic. And then once the New England Journal papers and the New York Times wrote about it, the Korean medical authorities said no more. And it, and it just sort of fell, fell right off. So it, uh, it's really about how hard you look for it. And a lot of people have, you know, like you go to the thyroid meetings and the companies with the ultrasound machines are offering free ultrasounds and, you know, they find lots of nodules, some of which are going to be microcarcinomas. We're evolving in that area, though. There's surveillance programs at Memorial, where Mike Tuttle's running the endocrinologist, and he's, uh, you know, he's watching people with small carcinomas, known biopsy-proven carcinomas. We're watching. We'll, we'll send you off for surgery. Because the thinking is a lot of them will just sort of sit there and do nothing. So, first off, great seminar, Tom. Thank, thank you so much. Um, on the heart and cell thing, you yeah. mentioned that there was a nuclear instability and instability in the mitochondrial DNA. Is there, yeah, yeah. What's, is there some common mechanism for that? It sounds so yeah, unexpected. I don't know. I don't know. I think we still have a lot to do to under, understand all that. Um, and why is there such widespread genomic loss? <laughs> we don't really understand why it happens in adrenal cancer, too. Of the of the 90 cases that went through the TCGA, I think five had it, like a, a different you know, The rest are just wild. And they're really like the lowest grade cancers. So there's some trigger. But it can't just be as simple as like these different three loss. There has to be some other trigger. We tried to look for that and uncover the sort of the molecular switch that led to widespread and we came up empty. So and then yeah. another question. Are there demographic associations with some of these tumors, with some of these mutation types? Age, gender? Yes. Yeah, so certainly um, if you look at the pediatrics, the BRAF, P six hundred is you know increases as you go up in age the little Kids don't generally have too many of those. Um, there's obviously the radiation angle, but yeah, there are there are demographic differences. So like the diffuse sclerosis variant is classically a 22-year-old college kid who has you know 22 lymph nodes and other nodes and, and does quite well. Um, but there you can almost pick the age of, of those people. And then anaplastic really doesn't occur before like the fifth decade of life, right? So if you have a 22-year-old with a tumor you want to call it anaplastic, you would think twice about doing that. So uh, basically, one your uh, under question. So um, you said uh, the nafcanus activity was kind of correlated with a uh, low expression of the thyroid difference. Yes. Energy. Yes. So do you know how the mechanisms play out? Well, I mean, it's been known that the, that uh, the exact mechanism I do not know, mm -hmm. but it's been always it's been known for a long time that the B replicated tumors have suppression of, of those genes. But whether it's uh, epigenetics or I, I don't know the exact, exact mechanism there. Yeah. Uh, uh, you 
is there any gender variation in the distribution of this uh, driver genes? Is it more more likely to occur in female? Well, everything in the endocrine world occurs more often in females, Female, yeah. right? So, you know, thyroid cancer is no exception. Um, a lot, of, a lot of hypotheses about that, but I've never seen like an absolute convincing reason to explain why all endocrine disease occurs more often in females. I'm just wondering the, the few men with the PTC, when you look at the driver genes, you know, looking at the BRAF and the RAS type, yeah. any difference in the distribution? Yeah, so I'd have to go back a bit, quite a bit. There's not a strong difference. If you go back to the TCJ landscape figure, there is age and sex up there. Yeah. But I'm not aware of a big, I'm oh, sorry. Almost there. <laughs> so there's gender. really doesn't look all that strikingly different across the different genotypes. And our cohort is mostly from North America and had very little radiation exposure. Right. The problem with the TCGA was that they were under so much pressure to get the tumors in and through the pipeline that they, t they took, you know, whatever, whatever was available rather than say, let's, let's really pick an intelligent cohort to study. Like, why do so many, you know, just classic PPCs, you know, that are one and a half centimeter, let's do some more interesting. But we could not modify that process because they were under so much pressure from the NIH to get it done, right? And it's kind of an interesting intersection between politics and and, and, and science, right, because the, uh, the guys asked me last night, how did I get involved in this? And it's because I noticed that Arlen Specter, the senator from Pennsylvania, when they were doing the Obama stimulus, saw that an extra $10 billion went to the NIH and a lump sum payment, and $400 billion flowed into the TCGA. When I saw that story, I looked on the TCGA website and saw that they list of, made a list of tumors they were intended to study in thyroid, and that allowed me to then email someone I knew to sort of get my foot in the door. And then a week later, I was the chair. So it was, <laughs> it was uh, just a lot of, just some grit and being prepared and, and a lot of luck. But it's funny how, you know, if the economy didn't collapse, the TCJ might have never really gotten past the first five tumors. And there are a lot of cr cr people critical of it, but all these papers are being cited like crazy, and I do think they've added a lot to the cancer biology world. Well, thanks for the great turnout and uh, and your attention.